Hi, whether you're a first time YouTube guest or a long time member of our church, First Baptist Pulaski welcomes you. You know, our church family is messy. We are flawed. We have issues. We have sinned and fallen way short of what God desires and requires. But much of what motivates our worship is gratitude. See, God didn't leave us hopelessly wallowing around in the mud of our sin. No, He saw our need to be clean and sent His Son Jesus to take on human flesh, live the perfect life we could not, offer Himself on a cross as payment for our sins, and then rise victoriously from the dead. As Psalm 40 suggests, God lifted us up from the muck and mire, set our feet firmly on the rock of His Son, and put a new song of praise in our mouths. The truth is, we here at First Baptist Pulaski are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We hope the encounter you are about to have with Him puts a new song of praise in your mouth as well. And if you find yourself in our neck of the woods anytime soon, we would love to have you come worship, grow, and serve with us in person. Thank you so much for joining us. There's so many kids up here today, I'm excited that you're here. I actually have a couple more announcements. I know I gave you announcements this morning, but I just wanted to share something with you. VBS decoration begins Wednesday night at 6 p.m. If you want to help or be a part of setting the decorations up for VBS, we sure could use your help. Also, uh, two more things. If you uh, want to drop anything off that's uh, decoration related, if you have something as far as sports equipment or whatever it may be that you've mentioned to me that you want to bring, this would be a great week to drop that off anytime. You can come by Tuesday through Friday, drop that off in the office. This morning, guys, we are excited about what God's doing in our church. We're excited about what God's doing in our Go Kids ministry. And I've been praying this week about what to preach and what to give you guys and what we're going to do today. And God's laid this verse on my heart. He actually gave me two verses. John 3.3 3 says this. It says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say it to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then 1 Corinthians 5.17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. One night, a man named Nicodemus came and he talked to Jesus. As Jesus was talking to him, he said something that Nicodemus, he didn't understand. And we've all been there before. Someone said something to us and we're like, what in the world does that mean? Well, that's where Nicodemus was. He, Jesus said to him, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus was really confused. He was puzzled. He was trying to figure out what in the world is he talking about Unless you're born again, what does that mean? He just couldn't understand how someone could be born again once they're born the first time. Well, today, there's a lot of people in this world that still don't understand that. And we're going to talk about that today. What in the world does this mean for us? How does it apply to us? And what does it mean to be born again? So we're going to look at that today. If you guys will go ahead and make your way back to your parents, we're going to continue in worship this morning, all right? Every religion in the world besides biblical Christianity is about what we do for God. If there is a God, it's about how we live a life in our own effort that pleases Him. It could be doing benevolent things for the poor. It could be doing religious things of some ceremony. It could be entering into some practices or behaviors, but basically every world religion outside of biblical Christianity is about what we do for God. Biblical Christianity is about what He's done for us. Um, and then our lives become a way that we return thanks to Him, we worship Him, we say, you are worthy. And we're going to get a little bit, uh, we're going to get back to that idea a little bit later on in the message but along those same lines, uh, we have the opportunity today to, um, to celebrate and to thank the Lord through an infant or baby dedication. Uh, and because of our understanding of how Scripture uh, speaks of the truth of God and who He is and these sorts of things, understand that in our tradition, um, unlike there's some traditions say Presbyterianism, that by this moment Pres Presbyterian folks are saying, we're officially welcoming uh, this, this child into our faith community, trusting that God is going to bring him or her to faith. It's, it's, it's almost like a, it's, it's like a quasi-fence straddling thing that says, yes, God's going to do a work, 
uh, and we're trusting that that work is salvation in this child. Um, in, in other traditions, this is one of the sacraments or one of the things that we do to appropriate God's grace um, through, um, through the sacrament of, of infant baptism or baby dedication or, or whatever. In our tradition, what we're basically saying is we are thanking God for the life of a child. And we, with his or her parents, are committing ourselves to loving this child and speaking truth to this child in our community in a way that we're trusting God that he will lead him or her to faith in Christ. So that's really what we're doing today. And we have the privilege of doing that with, with Haley and Andrew, if y'all will come on up. And this is Grayson Knox, who has probably the, the most opportunity for the coolest nicknames of any child that I've ever known. Um, it's, it could be Knox, it could be Grayson, it could be Gray on certain uh, certain very appropriate Saturdays in the fall, it could be Smokey Grayson Knox, or you could just call him Smoke. I mean, you have all kinds of uh, opportunities for nicknames here, but just a little bit of sort of Tennessee history. Uh, Knoxville is actually named for Henry Knox, who was the war secretary for President Washington, uh, which is kind of interesting. I had to look that up myself. Um, a different Knox, John Knox, is actually uh, one of the, the leaders of the early Presbyterian movement in Scotland. And John Knox once said, I sought neither preeminence, glory, nor riches. My honor was that Jesus Christ should reign. So if you would, you sort of creatively combine the ethos of a powerful yet humble Presbyterian preacher with that sort of fiery volunteer spirit um, from, from a Knox that's closer to home, you might end up with a dedication verse that I would like to offer for Grayson this morning that actually comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, so this idea of Christ reigning, not only in his life and in this family, but through him touching others. We are not proclaiming ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves because of Jesus. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus. So what we're about to do uh, is we're about to basically pray and thank the Lord um, for Grayson's life and commit ourselves with Andrew and Haley to raising him as best we're able to, to love and know the Lord. Um, there used to be a tradition where pastors would hold children uh, and, and do this. Now we let parents hold children and we just touch them while they're not looking. Uh, it goes better for everybody. Uh, but I'm going to also ask Andrew, uh, our children's pastor, to come up and he has our traditional gifts here, a, a New Testament Bible and, and a spoon. That's kind of been our first Baptist thing for a while. And uh, Andrew's going to be um, responsible for working with the pals, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and the leaders to... Uh, to raise Grayson in a, in a way that, um, you know, maximizes his opportunity to know and serve and then proclaim the Lord Jesus like we just read. So, uh, Andrew and Haley, thank you for being here. We know uh, parenting is an adventure. It's already been an adventure a little bit this morning, um, but we're with you on your adventure. And uh, we love you and, and wanna, just want to pray God's blessing over your family and, and over Grayson. So, thanks for being here. All right, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the many ways you love us, but this morning, Lord, our attention to your love and your grace and your power comes through this amazing young man, through Grace and Knox Powell, and Lord, we, we just pray his, um, just your blessings over him. Lord, we would ask that, that you would um, move into his heart and life early, that you would uh, use Andrew and Haley and their, their extended families to, um, to speak the truth even on a heart level to him about your love, that when he finally hears the words that you love him, that it would make sense because he's been loved by his parents. Lord, we pray for Andrew and Haley that you would give them wisdom and sensitivity and strength and patience and endurance. And Lord, that they would know just how to uh, raise him in the shape that you've given him. So Lord, we commit them to you as well. And now, Lord, we commit ourselves to you that... Um, that as a church family, we would come alongside them and be your instruments of grace to draw grace into Christ. So, Lord, we now give you thanks for his life 
and for this moment and also our opportunity to worship you uh, through Jesus and by your Holy Spirit. God's people said together, amen. Let our praise be a welcome. Let our song be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are.
like you. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day, the opportunity for freedom of worship. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, and thank you for being a forgiving Father. On this special weekend, Father, we salute the men and women in our armed forces, those who have served, those that are serving, Father, those that are yet to serve. We pray for their safety, and we thank you, Father, for their service. Father, we ask you to bless this time in our worship service where we give back to you part of what you have so graciously bestowed upon each one of us. We love you, Father. Take these gifts, use them for the ongoing of your kingdom. Bless the gift and the giver. And Father, may your glory be spread worldwide in and through uh, the mission of, of reaching lost people for the name of Jesus. It is in his name I pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to remain seated, and we're going to join together singing hymn number 237, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 4. Jesus said, greater love has no one than to lay down his life for a friend. And we know that, as Bill mentioned, this weekend is a special day of remembrance uh, for us as a nation. You also, if you sort of read the news outlets, may have seen um, a poem or a reflection by a former Navy SEAL uh, this week, uh, Jocko Willink, who, um, who had some some perspective that, that maybe could uh, just season a time of reflection for us quietly before we open God's Word together. But just going to read some excerpts from this. They'll be on the, the screen for you as well. I am the fallen soldier, sailor, airman, and marine. Remember me. I'm the one that held the line. Sometimes I volunteered, sometimes I went because I was told to go. But when the nation called, I answered. I fought at Lexington and Concord as our nation was born. I crossed the Delaware on Christmas Day in 1776. Freedom was on our side. In the Civil War, I fought with my brothers and against my brothers. At Gettysburg and Shiloh and Bull Run, I learned we must never again divide. In World War I, I marched on the Marne and held the line at Belle Isle Wood, the war to end all wars, they called it. In World War II, I fought everywhere. From the beaches of Normandy and the Battle of the Bulge to the sands of Iwo Jima, I stood against tyranny and kept darkness from consuming the world. In Korea, I landed at Incheon and broke out of the Chosun Reservoir. They called it the Forgotten War, but I never forgot. 
In Vietnam, I went and fought the Mekong, in the Mekong Delta and at Yai Drang and Khe San and Hamburger Hill, and some say my country wavered, but I did not waver, ever. I fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and Baghdad, Fallujah, and Ramadi. I stood my ground, sacrificed my life, my future, my hopes, my dreams. I sacrificed everything for you. This Memorial Day, remember me, the fallen warrior, and remember me not for my sake, but for yours. Remember what I sacrificed so you can truly appreciate the incredible treasures you have, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. You have the joys of life, the joys that I gave up so that you can relish in them. Live a life that honors the sacrifice of our fallen heroes. Remember them always and make every day Memorial Day. His point, of course, is that it's, it's not just about us waving a flag. Uh, it's not, and as a former service member myself, uh, Memorial Day is a special day because we commemorate those and their families, by the way, uh, who suffered the loss of them not coming back. Um, it, it's a special day of remembering those who gave their all. All gave some, we say, but some gave all. And today we remember that. But remembering them is, is not just about um, a ceremony. Jocko's point is that if they gave all that they had, we should appreciate that sacrifice and honor them by living well. That's his point. As Americans, we should live well. As citizens of the planet, we should live well. I'd like to offer just a couple of quotes that kind of drive this home from other people and then just have a moment of silence uh, for you to pray in your own way, uh, not only for those servicemen and women and their families affected by this ultimate sacrifice, but also remember on a day like today too that, and we'll get to this in a second, that the sacrifice of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, should also impact how we live every day. If we appreciate his sacrifice, it ought to change how we live as well. Wallace Bruce said, who kept the fight and fought the fight? Who kept the faith and fought the fight? The glory theirs, the duty ours. It's the same point that Jocko was making. The glory theirs, the duty ours. Cynthia Ozick, we often take for granted the very things that most deserve our gratitude. Freedom. For us as Christians, freedom in Christ, freedom from sin and death, these sorts of things. So if you will, just take a moment in the quietness of your own heart in the silence of this room and thank the Lord um, as you're led. Father, to you, through your Son, and by your Spirit, we have prayed these things with grateful and heavy hearts, but also hearts that are drawn to liberty. Um, Lord, help us now turn our attention to the deepest freedom and liberty that is available in your creation, that which comes through your Son. Amen. The San Jose was a 62-gun, three-masted galleon, the flagship, if you will, of the Spanish Armada, the Spanish fleet. It traveled from Panama to Colombia and went down in its travels on June 8th 1708, during a battle with British ships in the War of the Spanish Succession. The ship has made news recently. 600 souls on board when it went down. 600 people lost their lives when attacked by these British ships. The powder keg, the, the armory on this galleon was hit and it exploded instantly. With no time to recover the people or the possessions, the cargo on that ship, the ship went down. As technology has advanced over these 300 years, researchers have spent now more than the last 30 years trying to find this particular Spanish ship. They've spent north of $25 million scouring the ocean floor for this ship, which lay off the coast of Colombia at about 2,000 feet below sea level. It's pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, that's crushing depth. The discovery of this ship, because of technology, was made three years ago. In 2015, has sort of been kept under wraps, but has been disclosed recently. Why do you think people 
would spend all that time and all that money and all that effort to find this ship, to find this piece of history, to get connected with our past, maybe, sure, of course, to appreciate culture, yes, to understand how civilization changed, yes, of course, they did that for those reasons, in part. But on this particular galleon, there were more than 20 million gold and silver coins that were on this boat when it went down, on this ship when it went down. Over 20 million gold and silver coins. Thousands upon thousands of emeralds in this particular ship. So why do you think it is, really, that people were that anxious to find this particular sunken ship? Because it was worth a lot. As a matter of fact, some estimates approach for the value of this wreck $20 billion with a B, $20 billion. So if you could invest $25 million and get $20 billion, would you do it? Sign, sign me up. If I had it and I knew that there was that kind of return, sign me up. Now there's obviously some legal thumb wrestling going on between the salvage company and Columbia and the parties involved in these sorts of things. Why? Because we're talking about a lot of money. But when they found this wreckage at 2,000 feet below sea level with the cannons and all the pottery and everything, again, they were shocked and amazed to find over 20, the beginnings of 20 million gold and silver coins. I mean, it's just, it's mind-blowing. But in real life today, this expedition, this salvage operation, reminds us of a principle that we all know. It's that people work sacrificially for what they value. We work sacrificially for what we value. We know this. God's Word even speaks to this. We're going to look at two primary passages today. If you would, the first passage is in Matthew 13. So if you'll find that in your Bibles, Matthew 13, just a few verses here. If you're new to us, by the way, the number's under the Scripture reference there. The first number is if the, the, those black pew Bibles are shorter than the hymnals. That's the number you're looking for. If they're the same height, the large print Bibles, it's the next number. So page 634 in the short ones or 899 in the tall ones. But we're again in Matthew 13 where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his followers, and he's explaining some things about the kingdom of God. Uh, Bill, as he was praying for the offering, prayed for the advancement of God's kingdom. Uh, and what, those words, because they become familiar to us in our context, sort of at times lose the significance because they just kind of wash over them, us because we're used to hearing them. But the, the whole idea of kingdom, and by the way, this is a, a pretty, how can I say it? It's a fairly loaded word that sometimes is, is band, bandied about in, in theological circles. People try to argue about the technical meaning of this, um, and we'll see why in just a second a little bit, and I'm not going to answer all your questions, but I'll just uh, address it a little bit. So if, you, if you're in Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Whether it's the San Jose wreck, uh, 25 to 20 billion, you know, that whole thing, or in this case, the kingdom of heaven. You find something valuable, you sell all you have and go buy it. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And when he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. So this, again, this passage that Jesus is, uh, you know, quoted in and this passage God's sharing with us drives home the message, we work sacrificially for what we value. When you find a hidden treasure, you find a pearl or whatever, you're going to sacrifice for it. You're going to do whatever it takes to get it, to protect it. Uh, and these sorts of things. Kingdom, again, that Bill prayed about and that I alluded to. The kingdom of heaven, and as Matthew sort of refers to things, and then kingdom of God is another reference in the New Testament. There's some nuancing that goes on there. But if you think about kingdom, 
Um, and the nuancing, by the way, has to do with, is it the sphere of all creation? Is it the sphere of those who are in the faith? Is it the sphere that God controls now in temporal time and space for those who are yielded to him? Is it talking about a future reality beyond the now? Okay, I can't answer all those questions. What I can say is this. Kingdom essentially means the, the, the boundaries of God's control. So... When Bill's praying over the offering and he says, for the advancement of your kingdom, God is both sovereign over the universe in allowing all things to happen without choosing sin and pain and death and these sorts of things. He's allowing our choices to be our choices, so he's sovereign without controlling all those things. But but the kingdom of God, more specifically, in other passages, is talking about us surrendering to the righteous reign of God in our life, beginning with faith in Christ. So if you start to think about God's reign or God's control as the king who is reigning, the kingdom of heaven is is an allusion to this idea of God reigning in a way that that begins now and extends in the future, but it's mostly an issue about our hearts. Are we allowing God to reign in our hearts? The first step of allowing him to be our sovereign and reign in a personal way is by accepting the truth of his son, Jesus. Have you done that? Have you done that? Have you accepted the truth of his son, Jesus? Because again, the big idea here, we work sacrificially for what we value. I alluded to that conversation earlier that I was having with someone just yesterday uh, about how it's, it's not about what we do for God. It, it's ultimately about what he's done for us that motivates what we do for him. It's, it's kind of, it, it's, it's different. It's not about us trying to please him. He's already pleased with us in Christ if we have faith, if we've accepted Jesus. So that motivation begins to change. But this principle about working sacrificially for what we value, when you step back and look at your life, what are you working sacrificially for? What are you working hard for? Uh, This principle translates to lots of different areas, of course. We might work hard at work, uh, our our day jobs, if you will. Why? Well, to provide for our families, for our our future stability and retirement or things like that. It could be in the gym. Maybe you're a a fitness person. Uh, You're working for your health or you're working for an advantage on the athletic field. Or maybe you're working hard so you can look good to, you know, uh, get to know someone. Uh, I don't know what your motivation is, but whatever that motivation is that's causing you to be in the gym, it's important to you, whatever that thing is. On the farm around here, you're looking to, again, support your family or, or feed the nation. You're looking for some independence, whatever. But we're willing to do hard things sacrificially when we value whatever it is. The author, Brett Harris, um, he and his brother wrote a book, but in this book, it's, he's, Brett says, we don't like hard things in our society, especially as young people growing up in a culture, I love this word, of adult essence. We avoid hard things as much as possible. We avoid hard things as much as possible. You know, the technological advancements in our society are great, and they're about making life easier. That's great. We can do more easier. But there's a principle that we're sort of deceiving ourselves with if we think that hard work is not good. Because working hard is good if we're working hard for the right things and for the right reasons. Because there are things worth working hard for. There are things worth sacrificing for. Everything that God commands is hard. Ultimately, repenting is hard, forgiving is hard. Overcoming sin in our lives, those persistent sins, is hard. Honoring our parents is hard. Sharing the gospel with those who don't know it, it's hard. Reading our Bibles is hard. Having a consistent time of prayer is hard. Trusting God for our futures is hard. Yes, it's hard. Those things are hard. 
It's almost like we need God's help. It's almost like we need His Spirit's power. It's almost like we need the truth of God's Word to guide us. Yes, these things are hard, but they're worth it. Don't misunderstand me. God is not wanting us to live pain-filled, joyless lives of drudgery. It's not about that. Any of you know who have been in the gym or been at work or been in school or been on a sports team or whatever, you work hard and accomplish something, you feel good about it because you've given yourself to something that mattered to you. Is our spiritual lives any different? And again, it's not about us working hard to gain God's favor. He's done that in Christ. Christ hung on the cross and said, it is finished and gave up his spirit. He finished the work. He paid the price. His body went in the ground and he rose three days later, showing the world his payment was enough. God is satisfied with us in his son. No amount of work we could ever do is pleasing enough to him because he's perfect and he's holy and our motives are mixed and our service is, is paltry. All our righteousness we learn in the Old Testament is as filthy rags to God compared to who he is. But, Sometimes hard things, sometimes even pain, is necessary to gain something of greater value. Can you remember a time on a sports team, as a student, a musician, as a Christian, in your spiritual life, that you ever gained something of real worth that did not involve work or pain? It's hard, it's hard, to, it's hard to come up with something. Because we also learn through hard work. We learn through pain that we're not enough, but God is enough. We're not in ourselves enough alone, but the community of faith is enough. We don't have the right ideas, but God has wisdom in his word. All these sorts of things, these, these difficulties drive us back to our inadequacy and his adequacy. By the way, if you want to take some notes, I'll have a few scripture references between now and the end of the message in the next few minutes. There's a place on the back of the bulletin. But Romans 5 says, We rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. Affliction or difficulty, endurance, character, hope. That passage goes on to say this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. It's not that we come to hope in our own abilities or on our own adequacy. It's that we come to understand the love of God like we prayed over Grayson at the beginning of the service that he would come to understand the love of God in a way that motivates him then to return that love. That's, that's basically... What we're saying here is, so now more specifically, if, if you're a person who is spiritually minded at all, is your spiritual growth worth the work? Or are we being really good Americans in our spiritual lives looking for the path of least resistance all the time? Are we willing to admit that Walking a life, walking in a way that is worthy of our calling in Christ is worth work, is worth digging in, is worth sweating, is worth pushing, is worth pulling, is worth grinding, or are we just going to float and coast and slide and just hope something spiritual happens in our lives? Because God loves us enough sometimes to arrest that slide and call us to an account so that he can speak into our lives and use us. Is our spiritual life worth the work? C.S. Lewis said, it may be hard for an egg to turn into a bird. It would be a jolly sight harder for it, that egg, that bird, to learn to fly while remaining in an egg or as an egg. We are like eggs at present, and you cannot go on indefinitely being just an ordinary, decent egg. We must be hatched or go bad. You, you got to break out and do work or you're just going to be in the endless slide. Are, are, we, are we content to be mediocre? God says, I wish you would be hot or cold. I wish you would choose one. 
Because this lukewarm nonsense, I want to spit you out of my mouth, he says in the book of Revelation. He's tired of it for us naming his name and living like the world. Is, is our spiritual life, our spiritual growth worth the work? Is our spiritual effectiveness worth the work? Bible study and prayer, and being in a Sunday school class, being in a life group, being in the future as these things grow in a discipling or discipleship, a D group, is the impact of our church in this community and in the world worth sacrificing for and working for, investing our financial gifts in and serving? Are the lost worth it to us? Are we willing to be inconvenienced? Are we willing to to have our plans, to have our recreation, to have our whatever interrupted so that someone else can know the hope we have, the freedom we have in Christ. Is God worth it to us? That he is worth us sacrificing for? These are questions we all have to answer. Dr. Beasley, uh, our Awana commander, shared last week, last Sunday night, a quote from G.K. Chesterton that goes like this, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. It's pretty strong. We don't try it because it's hard. But in the hard, God shows up and says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected, is shown to be what it is in your weakness, in your inability. Acts 4.12, there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Again, it's not what we do for God, it's what he's done for us in Christ. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Philippians 2.12 says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work for your salvation. Jesus paid the price. Work out your salvation in reverent fear Stay after it. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Run so as to win. In other words, give it your all. Not so that God will be happy with you and let you sneak through the gate in heaven. No, that's not, what, that's not how that works. That's not how that works at all. We are allowed by God's grace to enter heaven because we're robed in the righteousness of Christ through faith. So the running so as to win means we're going to give it our all. We're not just shuffling around the track. We're not just shuffling around the course. We're busting it. We're giving our all for the Lord as a way to say thanks. Interestingly, in the flow of this chapter, in Matthew chapter 13, this idea of sacrificing for something valuable can also be understood within the context of the example of Christ who was giving his all for us. Because he was a part of God showing the world that we are valuable. So what was God willing to do, the Father willing to do? Sacrifice his son. What was the son willing to do? Offer himself. No one takes my life, I lay it down, Jesus says. So God himself was willing to do hard things, difficult things, uncomfortable things, because we are a priority to him. So again, this passage in context could also be God works sacrificially for what? For whom he values. And he continues to value us and pursue us. We sang about it, but do you remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Here's the other passage we'll turn to. Matthew chapter 26 to kind of wrap this up. Matthew 26 it's kind of cool, 36 to 46. Matthew 26, 36 to 46. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. You see, I mean, Jesus wasn't just skipping and hopscotching his way to the cross. He's not saying, this is fun. No, oh, by all means, no. We're about to see that's quite the opposite of what he was feeling. But Jesus, by his example, because of his love, was willing to do something very, very hard. 
infinitely difficult. He said to them, verse 38, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. I need encouragement. But he's not just concerned about himself, as we'll see. He's concerned about them because I think what he's saying in context is the Father has asked me to do his will. The Father is asking you to do his will. Stay awake and seek his power so you can accomplish what he's asking you to do as well. Going a little further or farther, verse 39 says, He fell face down and prayed, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but you will. That's a dangerous prayer. Not I will, but as you will. Verse 40, then, came, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said, Peter, couldn't you stay awake with me an hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. I think again to deviate from God's plan. The spirit is willing. We all are going to say, yeah, that's what I want. But the flesh is weak. We're going to yield to that. Again, a second time, verse 42, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. Verse 44, after leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the time is near. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. This, this verse is so powerful. It's, it's short, but it's so powerful. Notice what Jesus says. Get up. Let's go. My betrayer is near. They're all sleeping in the face of his suffering. He wakes them up. And then he says, in the Tony paraphrase, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's get this on. Whew, mercy. I mean, if that doesn't hit you where you live, to know that the Son of God values you and values me enough to say, let's do this. I'm willing to do something infinitely difficult because you matter to me. Again, we started out this time of reflection thinking about our servicemen and women who have given their all. We can't help but think of the Lord Jesus who's given his all in this context today. We work sacrificially for what we value. God works sacrificially for what, for whom he values. We're worth it to him. Is he worth it to you? Is he worth you doing hard things? Is he worth you digging in? Is he worth you committing? Is, is he worth your prayer, your Bible study, your time, your money? Because let's face it, at the end of the day, it's all his anyway. We're stewards of these things. That's a pretty sobering question. Because if our lives are filled with self-indulgence and ease, the uncomfortable answer is he's not worth it to us that we're willing to do hard things. And this is maybe uh, a time where we have to admit that maybe some of us are in spiritual adult essence, and that's uncomfortable. But in God's grace, by his spirit and the power that he offers us, his grace can be perfected in our weakness if we'll just decide to respond. Will you respond? In whatever way you feel a need to respond, uh, the altar is going to be open during this next song. I'm going to ask Alex to come on up and, and lead us in it. would invite you to stand. If you uh, would like to pray, certainly pray. If you have a decision you'd like to announce to the church, please do. But again, our Lord's sacrifice reminds us of his love. So let's sing about this, 233.
sweet tea, unsweet tea, fruit tea, we all have our different uh, preferences of tea or not tea, water, uh, if you're from a different country or not from the South, I'm just kidding. Um, but we also have our different flavors of web browsers. My web browser of choice is Firefox, it's not a promotional thing, it's just that's my choice. Uh, about two days ago, I typed into Firefox, um, the, the Google search engine, you know, the Google website through Firefox, and typed in Memorial Day. Four out of the top five hits were about shopping or car sales or deals that we're going to get as Americans. One out of the top five was about what those who have given their all had done. That is telling in terms of how we view life in our nation. It's, about, it's a head nod to, yeah, you know, that happened, but now look at all this stuff we get. May that not be true of our lives. May we not forget the sacrifice of these these brave men and women who gave their all their families, as, as we as Americans live our lives, but even more so, that we forget the sacrifice of, cross, of Christ on, on the cross. Be near the cross, near the cross, remind us of your love so that it shapes our life. That's, that's really what we were just singing about. So uh, we trust God will do that as we leave. I'm going to ask Brother Rodney, if you would, to just kind of close us in prayer here, and, and we'll commit ourselves uh, to the Lord in our going. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, the fact that we do have grace because of him, and it's in that grace that we stand. Father, just remind us consistently that there are times that we get blindsided by things, there are times that we're not aware of things, there's times that we are so busy doing our lives that we miss the opportunity to be involved in what you have called us to because of the busyness of our lives. So Father, forgive us when we don't count the cost of what it is to be your disciples. Father, use us as we leave here, broken, messed up, arrogant at times, insecure at times, but use us for your glory because you have called us, you have created us, and you have equipped us to do the things that you have laid out in advance for us to do. So, Father, again, help us to count the cost of following you and to consider it cheap compared to what it is to glorify you with our lives. Father, we love you and we thank you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.